That's right, folks. It's been about 30 years since Kevin Neesman and Peter Laird's own reptilian fighting quartet from the Big Apple's been kicking all sorts of shell and ass all around. Not just in their comics, but TV series, the live action films, and don't even get me started on that recent Michael Bay abomination. And most importantly, and this is where this latest segment comes in. And well, folks, there you have it, my entire Ninja Turtle video game lineup. Sure, I might not have every single last one, but this is all I'm gonna have to make do with. First off, we're diving into the Turtles NES trilogy. Turtles 1, Turtles 2 the arcade game, and Turtles 3 the Manhattan Project. All by Konami, while the formal two are distributed by Ultra themselves. You see, Ultra was created on behalf of Konami to skirt their way around Nintendo's annual publishing guidelines for certain third-party developers. Like, what the fuck kind of shit was that? Anyways, time to kick some fucking show with these three. Like most reviewers of this generation, I too am also a casual fan of the Reptilian Quartet, having seen the 87 Murakami Wolf's once an animated series, as well as the live-action films by New Line and Golden Harvest during my childhood. And don't even get me started with that next mutation abomination by Saban, no rhyme intended. And most importantly, of all the legendary video game companies to do its source material justice, if not the most true at that, who else but the undeniable Konami, and or its affiliates, in this game's case, the short-lived Ultra Software Corporation. Basic plotline and concept. If you've read some of the comics, judging from the game's cover designed by Michael Dooney, or watched at least a season or two of the late 80s More Coming Wolf's Once an Animated series, you should already be familiar with the overall concept, as it's also applied to every entry I'm about to discuss thereafter. You guide the half-shelled horde in their trek to not only rescue their human reporter companion April O'Neil, and later their rodent mentor Splinter, aka Hamato Yoshi, but to once and for all execute the Foot Clan led by Oroku Saki, aka the Shredder, Tin Can, or whom I like to call the Shred Fuck. As for the gameplay, much unlike its subsequent follow-ups we all know and admire, this first entry involves a one-player-only adventure-themed gameplay and control scheme in which you take control of one of the four main turtles, Leo, Raph, Mike, and or Don, between which you can switch at will at any time simply by pausing, whilst gaining important info from the preceding Splinter, or April later, exploring certain parts of the Big Apple. There are two viewpoint elements to take into consideration, a top view perspective of the stage you start in, except for the very last stage, and the usual side view perspective whenever you enter certain buildings and sewers, in the style of Getsu Fumaden, which Konami made not long before, as well as Takara's infamous Lost Word of Jenny. As mentioned before, you're tasked with rescuing April, in the case of this first area alone, by killing off various enemies in those preceding interior areas. Some of which either A. appeared in the comics and or the TV series, or B. created especially for this game alone. In between and or at the end of certain areas, you face a random mini-boss, composed of a common enemy, and or the main boss. For example, Bebop, Rocksteady, the Shred Dick's henchmen. Despite having the same goddamn offensive and contra-like jumping and underwater swimming capabilities, which is only in the case of Area 2, each turtle has a different attribute about them. Leo and Donnie both possess long-range weapons, but Donnie's trademark bow staff deals way more damage to certain enemies than everyone else, making them more or less epic failed characters, despite Mikey's trademark nunchakus hitting way harder than Raph's Psyblade and Leo's katana combined. Since the turtles are heavy za addicts, and this is where the power-ups come in, they can replenish their health by consuming either one pizza slice, which is 25% of a turtle's health, two units to be precise, half a pizza, which is four units, 50% of a turtle's health, or a whole pizza, in which case, hence said type, a turtle's health is fully refilled. For sub-weapons, simply push select to enable it. There are two types of shurikens. Your turtle can fire off either one or three stars, depending on which type you've procured. Boomerangs, where if your turtle throws up the three of them at a time, they can either fly back to you or away from you, and you can even distribute them to the other turtles by switching to them on the fly. And finally, there's the Magic Key Scroll, in which your turtle fires off a powerful as hell energy wave, dealing slightly more damage than even Donnie's bow staff. Take note, they can go to waste very quickly, so if I were you, I'd put those weapons to the most sensible use possible. 
And most importantly, there's the rope for crossing faraway gaps between buildings, needed only in Area 4, despite April informing you that you need them in the stage before it, when in reality you don't. Party van missiles, needed for the barricades in Area 3. And speaking of the party van, no matter which turtle you have selected, even while you're driving around the city within it, the energy meter of the party van is the exact same. Twisted, ain't it? Should any one of the four turtles get his ass wasted, or in this case, their shells, they're captured in an instant heartbeat, but you can rescue them in a later part of the game. If the entire game gets wasted, however, it's an instant fucking game over. You only get a limited number of continues, like most Konami games, obviously, except maybe for the Castlevania series, in this game's case, too. But you can also bump up the limit to four using the ever-so-famous Contra code at the title screen. Despite how stagnant and half-assed the controls can get, they're at least susceptible even to endure the most intense as shit challenges ever. Speaking of, aside from the responding groups of enemies every time you exterminate them and backtrack, Ninja guide in anyone, and a reliever come back into a certain building and or sewer. Later stages involve having to jump to even the trickiest gaps, or hell, walk over them. And don't think I'm not aware of that fact just because I saw AVGM's review many years ago. Not to mention hard to reach power-ups and traps every which way. For example, the moving spike walls in Area 4 before reaching the giant mouse or others. There's even that preceding infamous underwater section in which you have to disarm all eight of the bombs in order to prevent the dam from getting trashed by those foot cocksuckers. While reaching every last bomb, the traps are as endless as every season we typically live through, the spark-infused seaweed, the instant death coral, and don't even get me started with those fucking electric beams. If you're not mindful and on point every damn second, your ass is more than likely asking to get shell-shot, no pun intended. Anyways, the only way to tackle that run was using the absolute weakest in attack turtles, namely Raph and Mike. And should either of their energy levels, if possibly those of the whole damn quartet, reach 50% or below, I strongly suggest switching to someone else, and fast. Also, when it comes to facing certain bosses, it never hurts to have a foolproof strategy in place. For example, using Donnie to obliterate Rocksteady and even the giant Mouser, having enough sub-weapons as possible to exterminate other bosses, avoid every possible enemy attack and or environmental hazard, I could go on all day despite how ridiculously easy each and every last one of them turn out to be. As for the Technodrome boss in Area 5, its location is picked at pure random no matter how often you play, in one of the three underground terrains no less, in which case I highly suggest exhausting every goddamn possibility. Graphically, even after all these years, the game's overall visual presentation is nothing short of a mixed bag. Not that it sucks in any shape or manner, which I've been hearing from countless reviewers time and time again. Despite this game being oversimplified and outdated, most of the characters, enemies, and stages are designed fairly spot on, even if most of the urban backgrounds resemble way more the Land of the Rising Sun, specifically Osaka, than the Big Apple, and gracefully, staying true to its source material no less. In terms of music and sound, composed by Keizo Nakamura and or Jun Funahashi, the overall game soundtrack boasts its hard rock and pop jazz fusion tunes, and as we'd expect, one of the NES's most well-regarded of all time, no less. Although I've also been hearing time and time again that none of the tracks are in any way connected to its source material, I am verbally documenting myself by stating otherwise. Certain parts of the game's music, for example the title theme and the stage clear theme, contain the TV show's iconic ending riff, while every other track is uniquely composed, as ever, to correlate with the mood of certain game incidents. My top 5 personal favorites are as follows, the preceding title theme, the underwater stage where you disarm the bombs, both parts of Area 5, the top view overworld area, and the side view warehouse and underground areas, and finally the boss theme. Considering TMNT's replayability, due to the aforementioned frustrating yet crucial bullshit, for instance the tricky jump physics and the offensive tactics, among others, not to mention the exhilarating yet monotonous freedom of exploration throughout various areas, its fun factor is definitely within reach albeit somewhat lacking. However, I will be merciful in dictating that it's a rather solid game, despite its obvious flaws, which I highly suggest looking past. Exhibits B and C respectively, Ninja Turtles 2 and 3, the arcade game, and the Manhattan Project. Despite my suggestion for everyone to refer back to what I've mentioned about the concept for the first Ninja Turtles game, why not mention it here? It's your usual save April and later splinter while knocking the Foot Clan's dicks in the dirt type spiel. 
Around the same year as the preceding Ninja Turtles game we've discussed, the arcade game beat-em-up we all know and love, that came in both the two-player and the ever-so-popular deluxe four-player cabinets, became such an instant hit, it was ported to various consoles and home computers, including the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, the Amstrad CPC, the Commodore 64 and Amiga, the Atari ST, and even the IBM PC. However, the port we're dealing with is for our ever-so-beloved NES. Onto the basic gameplay and controls. If you've played the original arcade game, it's the same dealio. You pick one of the four main half-shelled honchos, following a brief yet iconic opening cutscene depicting April's apartment building getting torched. The force bring into action, except you can only play up to two players in this version. Unlike other NES games where you can play four players via its four score adapter, for example Nightmare on Elm Street by Eljan and Rare, Mindscape and Atari's Gauntlet 2, Hudson Soft's Bomberman 2, Mule by Mindscape in association with EA and Ozark Softscape, Acclaim and Interplay Swords and Serpents, Acclaim William and Beam Software Smash TV, and various sports games. Again, here you can only play up to two players. Seriously, Konami and Ultra? Comparisons aside, all four turtles have their usual differentiating attack range and speed attributes. Leo can attack moderately in both cases, Raph and Mike attack fairly swiftly despite their short ranges, and Donnie can attack deliberately despite his long range. You can actually control any one or two of them using the D-pad, obviously, and being able to attack and jump respectively. Like most beat-em-ups, you can actually pull off combinations with those two buttons, a standard jump kick, A and then B, or in this game's case, a swift sweeping jump attack special with their weapons, via the A and B button simultaneously. Compared to the original arcade version where the turtles can perform overhead slams, none of these techniques are seen let alone pulled off here, due to limitation issues of course. And don't even get me started with the environmental distractions and weapons either, they're much more of a tactical aid than anything, for example parking meters, fire hydrants, exploding metal barrels, etc. At certain portions of a stage, they can replenish their health, how? The usual za slices of course, and that's a total no-brainer for sure. And every 200 points your turtle scores, an extra life is awarded, like most arcade-style games, obviously. Onto the enemies, they consist of an endless army of multicolored foot soldiers, most of which sport a certain offensive tactic depending on the colors they wear, like the standard purple foots which punch, pull full Nelsons on their adversaries, and sometimes throw shurikens, dynamite, and even tires. The yellow boomerang foots, the white rapier foots, the blue foots that throw knives and at times ride motorcycles, the magenta mallet wielding foots, the red machine gun sporting foots, and even attack chopper pilots and the like. Roadkill Rodneys, Mousers, Cyborg Flies, Robot Walkers, a random skateboarding hipster girl. Really? Yeah, go straight to hell, you slut. And some exclusive new enemies including a half-cybernetic Frosty the Hitman, light blue foots that throw snowballs, midget ninja droids, and get these, ravenous renaissance poltergeist tigers, and even fucking robo-scorpions. Thought I'd forget about the bosses? Consider yourselves mistaken. Rocksteady and Bebop are back as we'd expect, in separate stages no less. The only exception is they don't reappear together in a dual boss here, unlike the arcade version. Scientist Baxter Stockman, not only in his human form hovering in his airship, as we'd also expect, but in addition, his ultimate fly form, replacing the aforementioned dual boss refight with Rocksteady and Bebop. Not to mention Granitor, General Trag, and of course, Krang and the Shredfag. For this particular NES port, there are two stages not seen in the original arcade. The Winterized Central Park stage, featuring Tora, aka whom I like to call the bastard cousin of Arnold the Pitbull from Tiny Toons, minus the shades, and even a Japanese martial arts dojo, featuring the Shogun, who's a merciless android samurai who makes even Hagane from his game look like Bender from Futurama. And depending on your offensive tactics skill, they'll either put up somewhat less, if maybe more, of a fight, or flat out leave much more than just your shell on the mat in no time thus landing and chaining every overpowered as fuck offense they've got on you like there's no tomorrow. And this is where the next topic comes into play. Must I mention how spot on the controls are, despite how jerky they are due to minimal yet distinctive awkward hit detection cases, even after god knows how many years? Much more than those bastard enemies and bosses I've mentioned, various parts of this game will keep you occupied in more ways than you think, not that I'm flogging a dead ass horse on those two aspects alone. There's even environmental hazards, like the original arcade version, obviously, to look out for and take into account. Falling cannonballs, randomly falling signs, snowplow trucks, accidental sewer falls, parked cars that drive off without any warning, drive-by foot cruisers, laser cannons, both stationary and moving, free sprays, I could go on all day or night. 
All in all, the amount of challenge is nothing short of tolerable, not too cakewalkish, and not too much of a detestable, Christ forsaken pain in the fucking testicles! Like some games out there, of course. You only get 3 lives, or 10 using one of 2 codes, and one of which is a variation of the famous Contra code we well remember, and 3 continues, thus resetting your overall score, like most Konami arcade games, which, if your senses and tactics aren't up to elite standards, will be used up faster than your weekly allowance. As far as the graphics go, although they're a step down from the original arcade counterpart, as we'd obviously expect, no wonder the technical gap between the arcade and console graphics was that goddamn huge! The overall visual presentation doesn't disappoint one freaking bit. Nami and Ultra pulled way more strings than one could possibly count in refurbishing each and every element of the original arcade version, providing us with the most recognizable and gritty, vibrant backgrounds, not to mention recapturing the overall incidental cutscenes and character portrayals, the usual heroes, enemies, what have us, thus making it a top-notch, 8-bit representation of the preceding original arcade, despite the console's limitations. And, though it's an unabashed understatement, light years better than those other ports I've mentioned. Also, whenever a turtle falls into a sewer, their intended sayings are represented visually compared to the original arcade. Even more mind-blowing, there's even random ads for pizza in certain stages, in the American and European versions only, of course, not to mention coupons for a personal pan pizza from these guys in every copy back when this game was all the rage. Though it's at the same time mind-boggling how well those promos paid off for not only Pizza Hut themselves, but for the combined efforts of Konami and Ultra, and even Mirage Studios themselves. Composed by Kozo Nakamura, not to be confused with the other Nakamura guy I mentioned, based on the original arcade soundtrack by Mutsuhiko Izumi and Mikihika Shino, aka Miki Chang, and that of the late 80s animated series, with Yasuhiko Mano helming the sound effects. Just like the graphics, most of the unforgettable songs are heard here, complete with three all-new tracks for not only those two aforementioned exclusive new levels, but for the second area of Stage 2, deep in the sewers after owning Bebop to be precise. They do a hell of a lot more than revitalize the feel of both the original arcade and the old TV series to a T, no pun intended, even after god knows how many years. Same story with the sound effects and the Delta Post code modulated sound bites. for instance the screams of both April and the skater girl you beat the crap out of, and the groan of the feet of later bosses. Concerning Turtles 2 the arcade game's replayability, other than each turtle playing the exact same despite their obvious attributes I've mentioned, as well as the tactical strategy you utilize and experiment in between each play, I'm going on record here dictating that both its fun factor and replayability are even higher than in the last Turtles game. If you're a heavy dedicated beat-em-up addict, much like yours truly, consider yourself psychotic to even pass up this and the next Ninja Turtles game that's up for discussion. here is much more offbeat and a definite far cry from the previous game by comparison, which features the same gameplay aspects. We see our old green machine faking while going cray cray in the old Sunshine State, down on Key West Beach to be precise. As they're about to watch another one of April's usual reports, more unexpected horseshit stirs the hell up. And their usual nemesis, Shred Jackass, not only takes April hostage as always, but brings most of Manhattan Island, thanks to his unmatched interplanetary Dimension X applied science, to a suspended aerial state. Sonic and Knuckles much? And as we'd yet again expect, it's up to the fort to kick way more motherfucking shell than ever! Superseding the same gameplay mechanics as in the last game, each and every turtle controls and attacks the exact same way as before, except they can now perform overhead tosses this time around, simply push down and be simultaneously. As always, you can play either solo or with a companion, but whatever you do, avoid playing two turtles A where you end up hitting each other, thus making your combined journey and efforts pointless if you intend to progress beyond belief. Battletoads, or hell, Double Dragon 2 and 3 much? They even have new super special techniques at their disposal, which are pulled off by, as always, pushing A and B simultaneously. For example, Leo has a Tornado Slash, Mikey has a 45 degree angle Kangaroo Kick, Donnie's got an Aerial Tumble, and even Raph's got an Aerial Drill. 
The only problem is that it drains two inches of your life every time you use it. Seriously, Konami? What the fuck? What's even more, there's a stable balance between managing your turtle's health and shooting for maximum points within stages. Again, just like the previous game. Should you get nailed at any point, you're given the opportunity to switch between a different turtle in between every life you lose. And speaking of lives, every time you score 50,000 points, an extra one gets awarded to you. And who could have guessed, the Zaw Slice refills are back, except they're very far and few in between unlike the last time. Want to know what else is back? Yep, you guessed them, the usual enemies, but with an even more expanded lineup than before. More foot fuckers, this time with more advanced offensive techniques than you can shake a stick at. Sand throwers, those that fire off two types of shurikens, one which you can deflect at will, while you can't with the other. A pair of foots with a laser guided by their respective cannons, those on surfboards, piloting attack choppers, those that jump out of the water, anvil throwers, once again, I could go on all day. Stone warriors with rifles and construction beams, bionic guardians, and if I were you, I wouldn't even get this guy started with the usual bosses. Aside from, yep, you guessed them again, Rocksteady and Bebop making yet another return, same with the usual Crank and even Shred Dick in both his neutral form and his overpowered as hell alter ego, Super Shredder, who makes even General Gus Grover from Shatterhand look like Private Gomer Pyle USMC. Various enemies from the Playmates toy line and later seasons of the animated TV series also make appearances. Ground Chuck, Dirtbag, Leatherhead, Slash, Mother Mouse Machines commanded by a random foot soldier. Hell, even Token and Razor from the second live action film, The Secret of the Ooze, make unexpected appearances in this entry, not to mention Turtles in Time, which was out the same year, if not long before. Both the original arcade version and the SNES port, which I'm about to dive into later. And despite the Triceraton Invader being featured on the cover, he's actually not in the game. Seriously, Konami and Mirage Studios. Cameo gloating aside, these bosses will leave your ass reeling in agony like never before if you're not up to snuff. So as ever, whether or not you're playing solo, I'd watch my fucking step if I were you. The controls here are much more improved and sensible than last time, as each and every failsafe technique at your disposal is pulled off throughout the course of the game without any static, despite the usual, if again minimal, off the map hit detection cases during various incidents. Concerning the Manhattan Project's challenge, my gentle Jesus, they really cranked up the tension beyond comprehension for this entry. There's more environmental hazards and traps than ever to be vigilant about than last time, including the usual falling signs, not to mention ground cracks, battleship artillery, partially severed areas of concrete, grenades, and even exploding sewer pipes. As before, you only get three, or in this game's case, five or seven thanks to the hidden option screen entered via yet another variation on the contra cut of the title screen, and three continues, and the chances are even higher than the last time, if not so much, that every last one of them will be used up. Must I mention yet again that they should be managed wisely? Graphically, the visuals here aren't too damn shabby as always, especially the scrolling of the waves in the second stage where your turtle is surfing back to the Big Apple from the Keys. Same on the battleship scene after it. Other background elements include the coastal scenery of the Keys, the half-rundown parts of the Big Apple deep within its urban outskirts, the subway systems and sewers, the rooftop, the usual underground technodrome, and even Crank's spaceship above the city at the end. And how could I possibly forget about the usual distinguishing cutscenes and spot-on character likenesses, not to mention their in-game appearances? Konami was not fucking around when it came to the overall graphical details. And it shows, even for an NES game released near the ass end of its soon-to-be non-goddamn-existent lifespan. For the music and sound, composed yet again by not only Kozo Nakamura, but with two others alongside him, namely Yuji Sakakura and Tomoya Tomita, the Manhattan Project's tunes are, without reservation, bitchin' beyond belief. Sticking as ever to its source material-laden roots, its compositions are a mixed bag, and definitely not the shitty kind, mind you, oh fuck no. In full honesty, while it starts out moderate, it kind of loses its touch around the 4th and 5th stages, but all in all, they don't disappoint even a smidgen. Must I go on any further with the sound effects? If, in this entry's case, newer ones at those, for example, the sand rubbing, the damage causing, weapon refiring, and the iconic Delta Pulse code modulated Kawabunga soundbite at both the beginning and end of the game. For fun fact and replayability, it's the same dealio as in the previous game, except it's way higher than before, if slightly, due to not only the usual differentiating series of strategies, but also the preceding opportunity to switch between the four different turtles after losing each life. Other than those, please refer to the same topic outlined when I discussed the last game. 